Hi. Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. It's a beautiful room, and um, thank you for coming all the way. I know some of you have been traveling from the East Coast, flying the East Bay, San Francisco. I myself commute every day from San Francisco to Palo Alto, but I know this is worth it. My name is Pashu Christensen. I'm the marketing and partnership manager for The Hive. The Hive incubates and funds data-driven businesses. And The Hive Think Tank um, is bringing together a community of data scientists, thought, thought leaders, practitioners, artists, designers in six main areas of expertise, which are visualization, data science, infrastructure, applications, design, and art. We organize two or three events per month. I think most of you are now databees. You have registered on our meetup group. Thank you to all the databees, the big one, the really big one, the busy ones, to be or not to be, thank you all for registering on our meetup group. We also have a blog where we have great articles, great contributors, great writers, and uh, we uh, publish a weekly newsletter, the Data Mumble. So if you are not, if you haven't subscribed, please do so. You won't be, uh, you, you will be happy. <laughs> Um, we have a lot of uh, exciting events coming up. Um, I won't go through all of them, uh, but stay tuned, make sure to stay tuned on our website, on the Meetup group. There's a lot of great surprises for you coming up this coming month. And um, so for tonight, the hashtag is HiveData. And we also have a Facebook page, facebook.com at hi, uh, slash hive data, where you can post your questions and suggestions. They will be projected on this screen, and Druba is going to read them for you. So make sure after the panel discussion to post your questions on our Facebook page so Druba can uh, address them. Thank you very much for coming again. I'm going to pass the mic to TM Ravi, the founder of The Hive. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. What a, what a great crowd. So we're, we're so excited to have you guys uh, come today. So many of you are asked, what the heck is The Hive? I thought Hive was, along with Pig, you know, a component of, of Hadoop. So it's a kind of a double meaning here. So the Hive is a funding entity. We incubate companies, we fund companies. These are typically applications that we, we, are, we are funding that sit on top of a big data infrastructure. So reach out to us later uh, if, if you're interested. If you're an uh, entrepreneur who's, who's trying to build sort of a company and focus on the, on the massive market, we want you at the Hive, so reach out to us. And, and so why the Hive? We, we provide a platform which, which consists of some great experts in the data science, in the big data infrastructure space. So our people are second to none. Uh, we have incredible sort of knowledge here. We'll help you get your company going. And of course, we'll give you some money also. And, and so reach out to myself, my colleague, Sumant Mandal, is, is also somewhere out there. And so with that, uh, I'd like to get things started. Uh, first, I'd like to thank our incredible hosts. And please join me in giving a round of applause to NetApp. So, so the, the folks from NetApp have some great products in the, in the Hadoop and in the big data space. So uh, go and check them out. And if I can just have the NetApp folks stand up for a minute so you can see who they are. <laughs> Perfect. So, so kind of uh, go after them once the event is over. <laughs> so, so with that, you know, the Hive presents the elephant riders. And, and so I'd like to introduce Dhruba Borthakur, who's going to be the moderator for tonight. Many of you know Dhruba from 
Facebook, and prior to that, from Yahoo. Thanks. Thanks, Ravi. Um, so I'm switching off my phone, just in case somebody wants to follow the lead. If you don't mind, I'm just going to put Facebook on this. Oh. Here? Yeah. OK. So cool, yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks for coming here. Uh, hopefully, you guys are doing good. So, and I'm hoping that we'll have a good, lively discussion. Uh, so my name is Dhruba. I'm an engineer at Facebook. Uh, work on some big data stuff as well as some storage and database stuff. And although the focus here is mostly to ask questions to our panel and kind of grill and drill them on some of uh, the nitty gritty details sometimes and sometimes the big picture. Uh, so the format, I think, um, the format that we could probably follow is that um, we will, tr I, I will try to ask questions and I'll also take uh, questions on the web. So if you guys have any questions, you could probably raise your hand or, or, and ask, but you could also post it on the Facebook page so we can all see your questions and maybe pick a few of them to be answered. Uh, so mm, thanks, Ravi, um, for being the force behind the, behind the Hive. Uh, he's like the creator and co-founder of the Hive, so thanks a lot to him and thanks to NetApp again. And thanks to our distinguished panel of experts. Uh, so before we start with an in introduction, uh, let's watch a small short video on uh, that kind of sets up our mood. Uh, shall we try the video? So that's the Facebook page that you can post questions to. Yeah, I'm going to use the click. I'm going to start on. Okay, the speed doesn't seem to be very good. It's kind of moving really slowly. <laughs> so um, um, I guess it's mostly based, maybe it's because of the network or something like that. Um, okay, so maybe what we'll do is we will uh, take, uh, we will try to maybe play the video for you a little bit later and see if we can get it to work at speed uh, towards the end of the presentation. It's a really interesting video. Actually, they're pulling it from there. Uh, let's give it one more try. <laughs> so uh, this is a, actually a video about big data. So it's a video as well as big data over there. Uh, so yeah, I think maybe we'll do that video. OK, we don't have the volume. We, we need the volume. So what do you guys think that the elephant is going to do now? <laughs> Any guess? <laughs> OK, but uh, like it's trying to delicately step on the trampoline, right? It's not like a rush into the trampoline. and. Um, So see, his steps are really small, right, at the beginning, uh, and kind of gain speed over time. And then he's going higher and higher, of course. Uh, and then you can see him doing a lot of tricks. So see? <laughs> Okay, so, so, so he's doing a lot of tricks now. So, um, so, yeah, so this is not a video that we created. Actually, Ravi uh, found it. Ravi, where did you find this video? YouTube. On YouTube, yeah. So I think, um, <laughs> no, no, it's not playing it again. 
No. Yes. So, 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 so the thing that we wanted to kind of show up here is that, yeah, Hadoop is kind of always people talk about Hadoop in the form of an elephant. It's kind of slow in the beginning and it tries to take little steps at a time and then kind of jumps and does all the tricks. So uh, we are here to kind of discuss some of the intricacies of Hadoop and let's talk about, uh, let's introduce our panelists now. Um, so we have Charles here. Uh, he's uh, VP of products at Cloudera. Um, and um, I have known Charles for quite a while now, uh, talked to him quite, quite often on other things that, that are how the Hadoop ecosystem is evolving. Then we have Srivas. Uh, he is the CEO of or CTO of Mapar, and I have known him for a quite a bit of time. Uh, then there is Sanjay Radia. He is a co-founder at Hardenworks, worked at Hadoop for quite a while. Uh, and then Jonathan Gray. He is the founder of Continuity. Um, so um, the unique thing about this panel is that uh, I have worked with like three of these panel members as colleagues in previous um, instances of time. So hopefully I'll be able to ask them tough questions and hopefully they won't feel bad if I really like try to grill them or something. Sorry, Charles. <laughs> mm. So um, shall we uh, do the uh, introduction slides? Uh, Srivas, you want to take over? Sure. So uh, if you go back, yeah. So MapR is a, provides a distribution for Hadoop. Uh, in you know, uh, we pretty much uh, provide the, the enterprise quality Hadoop that's out there. Uh, we provide it in three different uh, flavors. There's a M3 free edition that's pretty much uh, very widely used, uh, unlimited free, no crippleware. It's very very fast, and we support it through answers.mapr.com. It's a great website. I think a lot of people at NetApp are already using it. Uh, MapR M5 is a paid subscription version that uh, provides a lot of enterprise class features like uh, snapshots, mirroring, full EHA, multi-cluster support, uh, things like data placement control and um, uh, multi-tenancy. And then we have we newly introduced this new thing called MapR M7 that has uh, all of M5 and it's uh, enterprise grade HBase API. Uh, like like Milan Bandarkar, one of the guys here uh, I met, he said, takes the HBase, it frees HBase from HBase, right? So it makes HBase very good, very fast, uh, very robust. So if you keep going, um, and recently one of the things MapR did was, you know, we broke the TerraSort world record with help, the help of Google. I see a bunch of Google people here. Those are the folks we work with, and they graciously provided us a great environment in the cloud. Uh, the Google Cloud's, Cloud was an extremely performant system that you know, we were able to exploit to do this benchmark. Normally, I would not even try this on a cloud. So uh, then, uh, keep going. Uh, M7, which I taught, you know, we, we just released this. This kind of takes, HP, unifies, it's a unified data platform that brings together tables and files into one simple system with no extra management and yet all the features and functions and benefits that you normally expect from an enterprise class system. Things like unlimited number of tables, extremely fast response time, no co it's a compactionless system, there's automatic splits and merges and things like that, which most enterprise class uh, NoSQL databases today really have trouble with. And uh, what we're finding is it's really moving the needle in, in enterprise Hadoop adoption. So please go on. And then we also have started this project in Apache, which has gained a lot of traction called Apache Drill. Uh, it's a way to do interactive queries. I mean, one of the things MapR believes very strongly is that any API that your user programs touch have to belong to an open, open community, to the, to the community, not really to any company. And so uh, a query system is really something you interact with, and so therefore it belongs to the community. And so we, you know, we welcome a lot of committers to this uh, Apache Drill, which is really a SQL as well as a document format uh, query system very interactive, very fast. And uh, we already have lots of people involved. Uh, the open Dremel project, it's based on Google's Dremel. Uh, kind of, we took a lot of great ideas from that. Uh, and uh, a lot of people are involved. The open Dremel project has contributed its source to it. So that's where MapR is today. Uh, it's been very widely adopted by a huge number of companies. Uh, and I invite you to try it. Uh, you'll be very pleasantly surprised. Thanks, uh, thanks, Srivas. We'll have a lot of questions about some of the technology that Mapper has. Uh, let's give a chance to Sanjay, maybe to. Okay, hi. Uh, 
Uh, my name is Sanjay. Go to the next slide. Yes. Um, maybe yes, <laughs> but I have no control about it. So. Gotta ask in the back. Uh, maybe Pashu or somebody out there in the back could see if we at least show those slides there also once a while. Uh, go behind. Let's go. go back a little bit. One slide. This is good. One more. Okay, I guess the the text has come out kind of bizarre, uh, but that's okay. I'll just kind of speak. Uh, so uh, my name is Sanjay, I'm an engineer at, at uh, Houghton Works, a founder, and part of the original team that actually built Hadoop at Yahoo. And so we, as a, uh, so we kind of wrote about 80 percent, 70 to 80 percent of the code at Hadoop, and we continue. Uh, our focus is basically we continue to develop Hadoop. Uh, we innovate. Uh, uh, we have the core set of committers there. Uh, we also um, do the release for Hadoop. So every stable Hadoop Apache release uh, has actually been uh, driven by us, has been better tested by us. Um, um, and we drive a lot of the innovation there. And we also distribute our own uh, distro of Hadoop, which is completely based on the Apache uh, distribution itself that we release. Um, that, that we actually volunteer to release and test. Um, and so most of the testing actually happens uh, even today at, at, uh, on the Yahoo sites uh, internally and uh, as a pretty complicated and sophisticated beta process, uh, alpha beta process. Uh, we distribute ours. Ours is kind of 100% uh, based on the Apache thing. There are no kind of uh, hidden games here where we uh, you know, hold parts of it out or we uh, really certain other things uh, via, say, GitHub. Uh, so everything is based on, on Apache community projects. Okay, so uh, you can actually switch over from us to, to the Apache or back and forth or to any of our competitors. Uh, and, and we also support uh, 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 Hadoop. Uh, the current distribution is, is, that is in GA is Hadoop 1. Um, and it has a number of uh, the standard features you see, including it also has high availability, failover. Uh, and also what we call full stack HA, uh, so that even if uh, lower parts of the system dies, the other part of the system automatically adjusts as the failure is happening. Uh, next one. So I could talk a little bit about what's kind of coming in this, this, this coming year. Um, we have an open source project called Ambari that, that kind of manages a loop that's been open sourced. And we continue to make improvements on that, so you'll see a pretty, pretty exciting enhancements over there. And that theme has kind of actually gone through where we have actually developed a lot of the APIs that Ambari uses, and so all the products have become very manageable directly through, through APIs that Ambari uses internally. Um, there is a, a very improved focus on uh, con business continuity. So in addition to the HS stuff and the improvements you're going to see in Hadoop 2 come out, which is going to be GA in a couple of months, uh, which has got uh, HA that has got some enhancements from what is in Hadoop 1. Uh, disaster recoveries has got you know more automation on on mirroring across clusters. Uh, snapshots is something that's coming, so you'll be able to do snapshots uh, as you need. Um, there are improvements coming in storage. So, for example, storage devices uh, will be uh, be able to Hadoop generally just treats all storage as kind of very uniform and does not distinguish between different types of storage devices. That we're actually putting in changes into the core system to be able to distinguish that. So, for example you'd be able to take advantage of, let's say, a flash drive. And uh, so that's kind of the, some of the technology there. Another big, pretty important thing that's coming forward is something that we call Stinger. And so our kind of approach to, to fast interactive queries is that rather than create a, a separate project or a separate piece of technology, we're taking some of the ideas that you see in, in Dremel and PowerDrill, okay, and in parallel databases and actually integrating them into kind of Hadoop so that you'll be able to do, you know, the interactive queries that's five seconds to 30 seconds uh, or, or things that are non-interactive uh, where you're kind of doing data preparation, incre incre incremental batching, batch processing, and those will be done and actually also the traditional very, very large queries. And so the approach we kind of taken is, is to do that so that you don't have a situation where, oh, if your query happens to be processing data that's very big or the dimension table doesn't fit in a special server, it kind of says, well, I can't do it. And so this really is something that, that 
kind of scales all the way and uh, uh, works with small data very fast, works with dimension tables, and so the typical queries where you want to do more interactive, it works very well, but also scales to the larger size. Thanks. Sorry, I had to put the slides in one like one minute fast forward. So, so my name is Jonathan Gray. I'm the founder and CTO of Continuity. Um, prior to that, I worked with Druba actually at Facebook and uh, did a lot of the HBase and Hadoop, real time Hadoop efforts there, and a lot of the open source strategy. Um, and before that, I had a startup called Streamy where uh, we moved our entire infrastructure from Postgres to Hadoop and HBase in 2008. And that's kind of how I got into this world. Um, if you go to the next slide. So I've been building apps on HBase for four years. And I've been building HBase for three and three quarters years. And that's really an accident. I never intended to be a developer inside of my database. Um, but when we migrated everything at Streamy from Postgres to HBase in 2008, obviously there was a lot of things missing. And uh, basically, that's what I've been working on ever since. And I think the interesting part you know, from my perspective, as somebody who came to this community as somebody trying to solve a problem and build applications, rather than being a database guy, um, which I kind of am now. But Hadoop and HBase are engines. And they're, you know, I really see them as distributed data kernels. And they're not kind of full stack all the way up to your application. And the offline analytic component of the Hadoop stack is one piece of it. But there's this entire real-time side, and there's this entire user-facing, application-oriented side of Hadoop. And uh, so I've really been targeting Hadoop and HBase as this unified platform, where you don't just do offline analytics. You're not just some relational database. You're doing both of these things in the same place. And I think that's a really powerful paradigm. And so what Continuity is trying to do is say, there's this great kernel. There's a great engine down there. And these guys are all building this kind of stuff. But how does a developer consume it? And I don't think it's through HBase's byte arrays. And I don't think it's through a core just MapReduce paradigm. There's a lot of different ways that developers want to build applications. They want to focus on their business logic. And they want to focus on whatever problems they're trying to solve. And they don't care about schema design and configuration and partitioning and all that kind of stuff. And so what Continuity is building is really a distributed application server that sits on top of Hadoop, the entire Hadoop ecosystem and gives application developers a much easier programming paradigm that raises a level of abstraction, removes all of the unnecessary complexity, and it's also a hosted platform. So you don't have to run, you don't have to operate, and you also don't have to understand how do I efficiently you know, design my row keys in HBase so I get optimal distribution, and how do I configure the region size so that I can ensure that I have good locality. All this different stuff that bleeds into the APIs and it bleeds into the way that you build on top of the systems. So Continuity is really trying to bring a level of abstraction here and orient towards developers and just give them the level of abstraction they need to solve their problems. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Charles, you want to? Sure. So my name is Charles Lebuski. I'm the VP of products at Cloudera. Uh, Cloudera is about a four and a half year old company. We're a venture backed startup that's based in the Bay Area. And Cloudera was founded four and a half years ago. Uh, based entirely on the, on the belief that um, Apache Hadoop was going to be um, a kernel for a really exciting data management system. And uh, today, uh, you know, if you look at our identity as a company, we're, we are an open source uh, data management software platform company. Okay, so Apache Hadoop is at the core of that. Obviously, if those of you all follow Hadoop know, the ecosystem has gotten much, much larger than that. But I think that statement basically uh, summarizes our identity. So open source software platform company. And in order for us to be effective as a company, we basically have to lead in all three domains. We have to be able to provide a really compelling piece of infrastructure software, which is basically this, this data management platform that uh, has all kinds of great compelling enterprise features. Um, if you all want to get into vendor speak later on and talk about product differences, I can get into that, but I'll spare you, I'll spare you those uh, distinctions for the introduction. Um, the other two facets of our business that I think are equally important to providing a compelling product for enterprise customers uh, is uh, being a great platform company, and that means doing a good job of serving a commercial ecosystem. So we're really keen to further uh, the aim that Jonathan's talking about, which is getting more apps, more tools, more solutions built on this platform. Uh, today, there are about 450 different companies that build various types of solutions on top of, of this platform. 
Uh, so one of our other goals is to make sure there are lots of companies out there saying, you know, I always made money with Cloudera, right? We want that to be uh, another part of our business. And the third piece is open source. So open source is the well uh, from which we draw all kinds of uh, technology uh, that, that comes to this platform. And so it's incumbent upon us to replenish the well. It's incumbent upon us to be knowledgeable about the well. Uh, and so it's important for us to lead there as well. And so we employ a slew of open source developers uh, that further uh, various technologies that make up our platform. Uh, founders of about 70% of the open source projects that make up the Hadoop stack today work at Cloudera, about 45 committers, very high fraction of the kind of the development sponsored by a, 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 a software vendor uh, in, the, in the Hadoop ecosystem is, is, is funded by Cloudera. Um, we're about 300 some odd people today uh, and are, we're by and large are solving, uh, serving enterprise customers. Uh, you know, household names uh, might be someone like a, a Bank of America, um, an eBay, a PayPal, just to give a few examples. Cool. Thank you, Charles. Uh, thanks, esteemed guests, for the introduction. So let's go into some of the questions and uh, discussions that we have for tonight. Uh, I'd like to organize the discussion sessions among like three or four different parts so that we can focus on each one of them. So if you have a question and uh, um, maybe it's related to distributions of Hadoop. Maybe you can hold it towards the end uh, where I'll try to answer them, or maybe the panel will already answer. So let's first talk about um, the technology vision of Hadoop. Like, where is it going, and uh, is it something that can satisfy us for like a long time, or is it something that is shortcoming? So, Sanjay, I have a question for you. So, um, Hadoop is always talked about like Hadoop MapReduce, right? Uh, so, MapReduce, you have a set of map tasks crunches a lot of numbers and sends it to reducers, which maybe filters it down. So uh, what is your opinion? Do you think really that Hadoop is all about MapReduce, or is there something else to it? No, I think it's, it's actually uh, going beyond MapReduce, and I think uh, it's kind of driven from kind of two, two, two areas why it's changing. One is the fact that a lot of the queries that used to be translated into MapReduce is not always the, the most appropriate way to execute a particular query that's coming in. So uh, you will see queries like, for example, the way we are doing some of the things in this upcoming Hive Stinger is that it'll be translated into things that are not MapReduce. So people have realized that MapReduce wasn't always the most optimal thing to translate. Uh, so but you also in. said that Stinger is based on Hive. It's based on so Hive. So Hive does mostly MapReduce queries. Yeah, so we're changing, we're changing that. I so see. That so it'll be, so that the underlying platform will provide things that are not just MapReduce. So, so in your vision, you see that doing more stuff than just MapReduce. That and uh, that, and I think the other reason that it's changing is that people see this as a pretty big platform, and, and they see this as a compute storage platform, and they say, well, I mean, I want to do something that I want to run some of my services because I don't want to go and procure a new set of hardware to run service XYZ. I have enough capacity here. And so there's one of the things you see with Yarn is that you'll be able to run other kinds of services. You'll be able, clearly, you see things like uh, 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 you know, uh, other paradigms of computing, but also things like running services. So you'll see on the same compute platform uh, uh, other paradigms coming in, not because it's good for query processing, I but see. because this is a general purpose compute platform. So what about the other folks? Do you think, do you agree with that vision saying that Hadoop is something more than just MapReduce? Or uh, I know Cloudera is doing stuff with um, non MapReduce yeah. you know, frameworks. Uh, yeah, no, I think. So, do you think that is the next evolution of Hadoop that almost everybody seems to be doing that? It's, it seems so now, yeah. It's definitely a big part of it. I think, you know, it's, it's funny. Uh, three years ago, a lot of people were trying to make sense of Hadoop. And um, a lot of people said, well, what's different about it? Well, it can't be the file system. We've all had file systems before. Right. It must be this MapReduce thing. That must be the novel thing. Right. And so, all these database vendors said, you know, now with MapReduce, right? Which totally missed the point, right? Totally missed the point of what Hadoop was about. You know, MapReduce was the limitation of Hadoop. It was not, you know, it was not the uh, the centerpiece of Hadoop. MapReduce was a was a, a way that you could work with raw bytes or unstructured data, which was sort of very challenging to do in a database. But so that's that's a wonderful part of MapReduce. But but MapReduce is you know requires a much higher bar for expertise. It's batch. It's you know a lot of other reasons why it's not good for all things. Um, Hadoop, so, in my mind, is much more its identity as a storage is a storage platform first and foremost, a storage platform where you can bring different kinds of compute. Uh, there's been a lot of mention of these, of uh, I guess Stinger, uh, thanks, for, thanks for sharing, and, 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 um, and Drill. Uh, so just, uh, so, uh, so we, since, we're, since we're doing uh, product side, uh, pro uh, product um, discussion, so 
Cloudera launched a, a, a query framework which runs natively on Hadoop storage last year. Uh, it's called Impala. Uh, it is a kind of classic parallel uh, SQL engine. And the goal was um, uh, performant and also interactive SQL. And it's a good example where you basically have a general purpose. Sorry, good. No, but, but you also said that kind of MapReduce is like a liability for Hadoop. But how many of your current customers or how many of people who are actually running uh, Hadoop uh, they might actually be running MapReduce. MapReduce course. must be their bread and butter right now. That's the reason they're paying premium for Hadoop they're, they're, systems. They're not paying a premium for Hadoop. They're paying much less for Hadoop than they were for their RDBMS or for That's lots true. of other things. That's true. Agreed, yes. They're, they're coming to Hadoop because it's very inexpensive, it's very scalable, and it's very flexible. Right. And then they're putting up with the fact that, you know, okay, it's batch, and you know, there's a lot of other uh, um, things which have kind of narrowed the range of applications that it can No, serve. so my question is that if it's a batch system, yeah. then I think MapReduce works very well. Sure. Right? Because if you have Impala or Stinger or whatever else, some bees stinging here and there, but still, <laughs> it'll be like if you have 100 petabytes of data, you, you won't be able to like do extensive analysis unless and until you have MapReduce. Sure. Although, if, I'm sure you know from your own analysis at Facebook that you, know, you may have 100 petabytes of data, but how many queries actually scan across? Yes, so that's an interesting thing. Yeah, no, that's an interesting thing because, so, yeah, exactly. So, so you have a lot of data. analysis is not query, right? I mean, there's kind of some confusion here. Sure. So, yes. so, I mean, as you pointed out, it's big data, which means first and foremost, you have to store it and manage it and retain it, mm -hmm. right, at a very low cost. But so what, what I see as Hadoop evolving really is, you know, first you, basically what do you do with all this data, right? So you have to first find out different ways to capture the data. So what MapR is doing is working with Storm and Kafka and other technologies to be, and we added streaming NFS, M7, to be able to capture data in various different forms. Whether it's, you know, ultra messaging with Informatica or various other techniques, you know, with S3, with Amazon or uh, Google, uh, Google Drive or whatever. Then uh, after that, then you have to save and retain it reliably, right? After you capture it, so, so that's the storage so that's, portion, that's the storage that we, portion kind of we talked about. No, but but there's a lot right. of ultra reliability, snapshots, mirroring, multi-cluster data place, all that control. The things that traditional storage companies do, you need that. But you also need what traditional databases companies do, which is you know some of this data is not files; it's it's really you know rows and columns and so on, and some of it is really events. It's event publication and so on, which is more like a CEP kind of system, right? So once you have the data, now you can do two things with it. You can either analyze it, which is what MapReduce is all about, or you can quickly find out what's, what's there, which is query. And they kind of sometimes go hand in hand. They are not mutually exclusive, and they are not, uh, you know, they both are required. Yeah. But then, do you stop right. there? No, what MapR is also doing is going one step further, is actually now doing notification. It's not enough just to do query, capture, save, retain, analyze, search. So we are also adding, for example, uh, full text search, right? Okay. So, so, so you, let me so interrupt. Then, then you go a little bit further. We finish the, okay. the vision, right? Is that now you need to be able to notify people? No, who, but those have been done uh, for the last twenty years. They so may be people done, have but been notifying not, stuff. People yeah. have been built uh, messages. Right. Stuff. The, the problem. What is, is different here? So what the question. problem is that it's I have to buy twenty different systems to do it today, right? And I have to go and people don't want data in silos everywhere. No. So if I have events sitting in one system. My database is sitting in another system, and that's the classic Michael Stone breaker. I think that thing, right? silos have been there for a long time. It's so not nothing that has happened in the recent. So we're past. trying to unify it. So that's good. A lot of yeah. people have been trying to unify it, right? My, yeah. my question is mm -hmm. that if you're using Hadoop, I think you're using Hadoop only because it's big data, because there is lots of data that you cost. need to process. First is cost, right? So what you throw. So Hadoop's co uh, cost of storage on commodity hardware is 100 the cost of, let's say, a Teradata or a... Okay, user. that's an interesting point. Is right? that, so, it's, so therefore, it's disruptive. The cost is very disruptive. It's okay. one, one so tenth it's of... So cost per storage, which is... So yeah, therefore, things I would normally discard, right. now I keep. Agreed. Right? Yes. Because normally stuff you put on a tape. And the other part is, so how, how, how well can I analyze, right? A good example is this uh, presidential election, right? So you had one party that you know, looked at polls which polled... 1,000 people, maybe 1,500 people, right. and then the other party hold 30,000 people or 40,000 people. So the, the cost of ignoring the full data set yeah, so that, is actually that, infinite. Yeah, so you have the whole presidential my, election. So that comes back to my prim, premise that I made, actually, saying that Hadoop is all about big data. It is not about data integration. I think it's not about whether you are doing queries, point lookups, or scans. It's all about storing a lot of but, data. But if I can't get to the data, what's the point? I, yeah, I mean, I have I to get know, to the data after I store it. it all, I have to. It, it, all, it all depends also on your, on your definition of big. I mean, we have customers that run 
50 node Hadoop clusters and the data volume might only be five terabytes. So why do they run 50 node Hadoop because, clusters? Because the processing speed they need. So they so have the an SLA, they have an SLA, low, I, imagine, right? I imagine Facebook does too. I'm pretty sure some right. of your so clusters that, you care about, I need to recycle my ad targeting within two minutes okay. and you throw, you throw a lot of sure. notes at that. Okay. But by, by the way, I agree with, uh, with what Sriva said. I mean, it's not, it's not one versus the other. There's examples where you might have people that do a MapReduce pipeline, mm -hmm. and there's good reasons for doing it in MapReduce, and then as a result, you have structured data, and then you're able to let a user that knows BI mm -hmm. work, with, uh, work with the data at the end of that pipeline. Or conversely, with other customers that they actually want to let less technical users mm -hmm. do an initial query, and then they want to actually run an algorithm on the, on the subset of the results. Sure. Uh, no, I agree. I agree. I mean, it's a combination things, these of all these. New. These things are new. This is not. Yes. This is not nothing new under the sun. This was not possible previously. Like to to have to replicate data between different sets, two different tools to accomplish this previously. Like it's very, it's, very it complicated and, and unrealistic. So, yeah. so I think that's one of the things that's different about Hadoop today. Right. That's true. Anything you want to share? I mean, with I, I, Sorry. I haven't given you a chance. This guy's got it pretty much. Okay. I mean, yeah, uh, that's good. You know. <laughs> So, uh, I so mean, that, I think the other thing is that you know you don't have to throw away traditional system. You to throw away your data after a month. Right. Or so because you can, you can keep a lot of data. Okay. So you I can agree. actually go back and do analysis on your historical data. Right. So you don't have kind of cold data. All your data right. is either hot or warm, and suddenly right, right. cold data may become warm. So the vision again I mean, it looks also like enables new kinds of things, which which are you know where it's a combination of Hadoop and non-Hadoop, right? So yes. for example, we have a customer who's got an eight petabyte email system. Right now, if you use this traditional Hadoop, well, every night that you know there's like 12 billion files changing every day because those emails are files. And now, you know, you say, okay, okay, I want to run Hadoop now for spam analysis or porn analysis or phishing or whatever, right? Well, he's not going to forklift that eight petabytes into Hadoop nightly. I mean, that's ridiculous. So with something like MapR, you can run it on the same system because of full read write support. So I can run email and Hadoop side by side. Okay, let's listen to one of your presentation. Of let's stuff, listen to one right? of. Can we have? Uh, the next. <coughs> so I hope it works with oh. good speed. What? So let's look at one of your presentation and a short <laughs> clipping that you had. <laughs> uh, exactly what you talked about, MapR having read write support and all that stuff, right? Oh, we don't we have, have volume? Supported by NFS or okay. other different protocols. <laughs> Had enterprise class reliability with snapshots, mirrors, instant restart, and so on. And run, very, run it close to hardware speeds. That is, uh, when you're running on really large scale, your efficiency matters even more uh, because any bad code is now you know, magnified a thousand x. So that perspective, I think you presented in the Hadoop Summit or one of the summits last year. But more than the content of the discussion, if you look at a chart, oops, where did that go? Uh, so there you kind of uh, listed down uh, in the chart saying that uh, comparison between MAPR and uh, Hadoop, yeah, just leave it like that, that's good. So if you look at HDFS and MAPR, you get some comparisons, right? Sanjay, you have any comments on that? Like HDFS 150 million files, MAPR is 1 trillion. And then the number of data set, in HDFS we have 120 petabytes of data so in the HDFS. the thing is at that time, when this thing was done actually, right before the talk, I told him this, this was incorrect. And at that time, the particular <laughs> amount of data that was being stored at Facebook was over 70 petabytes. Yeah. At that time, it was around 70. Time, okay, minutes. and the fact that they say uh, uh, 10 exabytes. So I'm talking about real clusters having 70 petabytes in that day. Okay. And here he's talking about a theoretical 10 so exabytes start, based on number of bits. So in let the us talk about addresses. the theoretical. Then. Like, so what is the theoretical limit for Hadoop? No, hold on, before, before we get to that, I, okay. want, I want to start with it. Like, at least, you know, Cloudera, we get these questions. At least my response is, look, I can be an expert in Cloudera's product but I will not presume to be an expert in a competitor's product. Absolutely. So I have no idea what M3, like, M5 is fifth. capable of. I make, <laughs> I make no claims. I spend no time at conferences making claims about what someone else's product can do because you run into trouble, which is someday you're sitting next to somebody that built the product, and they might have, <laughs> they might have a different point of view well, about well, what it's able to do. I, I the moderator built the product I, too. I, I so agree with Charles, right? Out. Yeah, I yeah. agree with Charles. I benchmark a lot of software, but I can give results only about the software that I benchmark because I know how to tune it. <laughs> But let me ask uh, Sanjay this question. What are those limits for HDFS? Like, let's say the number, amount of data, theoretical amount of data that you can store. So, so, so let, let, me, let me preface this, right? So this is for one cluster, yeah. right? Yeah. Single cluster? This is single cluster, yes. right? right. Yes. Okay. Let's, because I think the single cluster is what we're talking about, right? Okay. Um, and uh, the definition of a single cluster is a lot of machines in one data center, hopefully. I mean, mostly likely it will be one data center mm -hmm. and managed by the same set of people. 
Uh, so if you were to take a federated Hadoop cluster, the number of files that you could store is in the order of, of uh, uh, a billion to 1.5 billion, okay? He's a federated Hadoop cluster. Uh, if you look at the amount of storage, if I were to look at the number of bits, it's, it's in the exabytes. If I look at the theoretical number of bits in the block size, okay? But to me, that's kind of pointless, okay? It is what is it actually being used in production and actually survive, okay? But that's, for example, the first one on the files one is something that we're addressing this year, where it doesn't store the entire namespace in memory, okay? And that's a problem that is being solved. So every time in Hadoop, we have reached a limit where actually customers need to solve it. We have solved the problem. So for example, you guys, took the federation stuff and deployed so, so it. I have a mistake, it should and, actually be 10,000 X then, not 1,000 not X. Okay, right. so, so that's what I'm saying is, is, is we've always, and, and most of our customers today are pretty happy with okay. the 70 or 120 petabytes that you currently store, and they okay. think that's pretty large. So I think my takeaway from your responses is that one is the practical limit and one is the theoretical limit that's being yes. shown no, here. No, that's not true, right? I just gave you an example. No, because you cannot claim that there is one practical cluster which is one trillion files using MAPA. No, no, we have, we have people who are doing 400 billion files sure, yeah. in one cluster. And, and this is so email we, yeah. that's running 250 million uh, accounts. Right, so 400 right? million and so, files. And 400 billion. And so the churn, no, no, let me yeah. just come on. So the churn on the number of files per day in a 24 hour period is they create 20 billion files and delete 12 billion files. Okay, so that's you know, how the many clusters I need. Just to do right. the daily work, how many clusters I would need from Apache, I need 20 clusters before I even, before I can even, that's just for the daily load. Interesting, okay. So, right? yeah. So, I just so yeah. So, yeah. Go ahead, <coughs> One of the great, the great things about enterprise software and working with large customers is that they have a process by which they evaluate technology and they install it and then they apply like their workload to it and then they decide what works for them. And so the great thing is, is like all of these sort of hypothetical like numbers of what, I, you know, the, the things, things that this, neither, I, neither one of those numbers, like there is, there is no 10 exabyte cluster running at MapR and MapR had never tried to get more than but 50. neither is it at Cloudera, No, right? exactly, but I'm not, I'm, it's not my slide. Cloudera. It's not my slide. I don't have right, to defend right, right. it. Right, right, right. So it doesn't I don't have to defend it. I don't, it I don't have to defend it. It's not at MapR, it's a customer I, of MapR. No, 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 right? I'm, no, no, you, there, I, you have a 10 so, exabyte customer? Sure. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so here's, and here's uh, yeah, as yeah. much as you have a one billion file customer, right? I mean, so I mean, I'm just saying, so, like, so this, 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 the point is, like, this, this is like in, in other, this is an artificial this, 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 is, another this is called cheap talk, right? Because okay. like, no one's actually going to verify this, right? No one's going to actually take the time to verify I, I, I think this. I just I customers are going to apply. Billion, right? yeah. 400 billion so. is pretty damn close to a trillion compared to 150 million being close to a trillion, right? So let's uh, get but, that number straight. Okay. Okay. You published that the number. second part. No, no, the second part is. I mean, the, the point here is not that it was one trillion or two trillion or 400 billion or whatever. The point is that you don't have to worry about running out of files when you're running a thing. I mean, if I look, now tell me at Facebook, one of the biggest jobs that you run is concatenating files together because you run out of files. Yeah, yeah. Is that absolutely. not true? Yeah, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Is that the same, same thing true at Twitter? Absolutely. I mean, we have two guys from Facebook. Yeah. So we have, and, and, and it's because, so Hadoop, because the problem is when you run out of files, Hadoop crashes and the entire cluster comes to a halt. Yeah. So as a practical That's user, the Hadoop, Hadoop. and I'm not aligned with any of the vendors, is that yes, Hadoop cannot support trillions of files. So we have a lot of processes inside to, to concatenate manage. files and manage files. So there is some overhead in managing all these files. So Jonathan, you have anything to say on this? This is great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, is, so, so now, now you have a cluster okay. capacity, you know, being used for doing something which it can't do, which is, oh, let me concatenate all these files because I don't know when I'm going to run out of files. And if you look at MapReduce, mm -hmm. the way MapReduce runs is when I run a job, it produces lots of files, right? Each partition, each, each reducer or each yeah. produ produces lots of files, those produce even more files. Okay. As soon as I run so, a hive job, I got gazillion files, okay. right? And so, so, so let not, me. and in Google, I had the same issue, yes. right, where we would always had to manage the number of files. Yes. And so it's very, very important to have an, unle it's not the size of the data, the files can be just, you know, 1K, 2K, 8K or whatever, it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, if, you know, from NetApp, from uh, empirical traces, okay. shows you that most, like 95% of the files are smaller than 64K, right? That's the empirical result. But, okay. so number of files is very important. Right? Okay, so I think, and, and so I, I think having I understand this artificial limit saying. is a real problem. I mean, sure, yeah. can you imagine yeah. how many name nodes yeah. I need to run? Yeah. We so, see like, having, like 400 name nodes yeah, just having to, to uh, to Having support to store lots more files definitely is a benefit, I think, because applications benefit if you can store a huge number of small files. Uh, on a different track, uh, let us move away from uh, comparing theoretical limits and talk a little bit about a little bit more of the vision about the Hadoop stack. 
So uh, I have seen a lot of storage move into like um, flash technologies, right? So uh, what do you think um, Hadoop would have to do uh, if we need to make big data work on flash? Uh, currently, most of our big data customers that I know of, please correct me if I'm wrong, they run mostly on storage disks. And, uh, but I see the trend going there. you have anything in common, Charles? Uh, I mean, so okay, a couple things I'd say about that. Um, so yeah, like right now, the um, nodes that customers tend to use, not all, but a lot, it kind of is, it, the, the design has roughly been kind of two sockets, you know, eight cores per socket, 12 spindles. Facebook's a little heavier on the spindle side. Uh, and some relatively cheap networking. And that's actually been a very stable form factor. Like, I don't think that node spec has changed a lot in like 18 months, uh, which is a long time, I guess, in, in, in hardware world. Um, now, you know, Flash is getting cheaper, it's getting better. It's so far, uh, the, the, the attempts I've seen in the last year, the economics uh, didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, Flash is really good for random, uh, random read, random write. The problem is Hadoop as a system was designed for, for scans. But, but uh, my well, no, 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 no. people asking you this question, are your uh, customers course, absolutely, asking you saying everyone, that, what saying, do I do to do it Flash? Absolutely, ever, but let me finish, right? So absolutely people are asking, okay. uh, when they put, and people built boxes that do this, and when they run the numbers on it, historically, uh, because the cost per terabyte of Flash is not, um, has not uh, justified it, given that it's not that much faster for scans. Flash is getting better, so we're actually benchmarking now. I think it will be possible probably in the next year where it'll make more sense for Flash to be kind of part of that reference form factor. But from my, from my own, I'm actually much more interested in, in memory. I think you know, what Flash will do to disk, memory is going to do to Flash. And if you look at the aggregate amount of memory that you can get at uh, in, a, in a moderate size Hadoop cluster and the amount of working data uh, you can do there, that's, uh, that's uh, much more encouraging. And a lot of the new frameworks uh, outside of MapReduce uh, make much smarter use of memory uh, than did previously. So that's actually, uh, memory is the new flash for me. So l let me add one thing to that. Um, so what we are doing right now is we're actually adding to Hadoop a way to actually add devices of different technology and to be able to actually expose that to say I want to create a file on a, on a disk of this property, okay? That doesn't mean, and so we believe that if, if te uh, storage technologies come, we'll have to be able to expose them and take advantage. And that's the under, underpinning hooks that we are putting in. But I, I kind of partly agree with what my colleagues said here, is that right now when we talk to customers, flash disk hasn't be become cheap enough for you to replace all your spinning disk. With the but you know what could happen is that maybe uh, you could use it for indexes for certain parts of things. So you may actually use it for not your bulk of your data, but for things like indexes, it may become that, hey, flash is the right thing to do. It's not all your data. And so we want to enable this. We're putting in the hooks to do that so that this innovation can occur. Okay? Exactly what's going to happen, I don't know. So let me okay. add, let's add to that. So I'm, and by the way, I'm total, let's, let's let that experiment run, and let's see how much, how much pickup there is for that. My only, and, and, and I can totally see the validity in, in, in doing what you're saying. The other thing I would just add, though, is part of the charm of Hadoop is kind of lack of forethought with what you have to do with your data, right? That, you know, in database land, it was, you know, let's think about your indices, let's think about your caching, let's materialize some views, let's do some aggregates. It's all the idea of, like, let's anticipate in advance the questions you want to ask and then set everything up just so. And Hadoop was, let's just throw a bunch of brute force cheap hardware at it and not stress out so much about, like, what questions you're going to ask in advance. So I'm not opposed to it. I think my only caveat is, it takes away a little bit of the charm of Hadoop, which is you know, not so much uh, uh, pre-planning uh, with the workload you're going to run. Because as soon as you have to plan where you park an so, index, so, you're, kind of, so, yeah. you're a little more like a database. So my opinion is that, I mean, that's one of the problems with Apache Hadoop, which is so primitive sometimes. I mean, <laughs> the, the whole, whole thing with, with MapR is like we give you full data placement control. So yes, when you want some data that is very, very uh, important to you that needs to be highly responsive, for example, what's in HBase or what's in some of the core tables that you need or whatever is M7, put that on Flash. If you don't like it on Flash, move it out. MapR can do that. And you can say, okay, restrict this only on these nodes that have Flash and these nodes that don't have Flash. So yes, from a general MapReduce perspective, MapReduce has been designed for streaming. It's not been designed for random I.O. So it does very well there. And that's why it beats out any other uh, so, yeah, technology I think out the there. Speed definitely the speed is one. definitely the is designed is for streaming, right? But when you have things like... Uh, so just putting uh, stuff into memory doesn't work, especially when everything is running in Java. In, in man, that, that garbage collection will kill you. Sure. Okay. So when, as think, soon as you have like a hundred gig of, uh, I think from what I understand from you guys is that there is there is potential that Hadoop could solve some of the data, you know, some of the problems if the data is in Flash. 
but maybe it's not yet there because customers are not yet there and the technology is also not yet there, maybe. Um, yeah, so we, we are, so there, here's yeah. the thing, we're adding, right. some, we're adding some of the technology there. Yes, I okay. know. So and right I right see now, things like, for example, you look, if you look at things like, like, like the work at Google on, on Power Drill, they talk about storing certain tables in memory, okay, and potentially flash, so that you're actually going to get, get, get uh, you know, be able to access uh, uh, a billion cells mm -hmm. uh, uh, in interactive time. Right. Because I see that happening. As far as uh, Hadoop is primitive, it's too old-fashioned or this, the thing is this, you kind of take a piece of technology that is open source, but you know all the good things about it and all the warts about it. And you compare it with another piece of technology that's proprietary with a limited number of customers, and you, can, you really don't know what is what sign okay, actually Okay, let's, let's stop. So, let's forget about proprietary and open source yeah, for this right, discussion. Not, this not is more like kind of right? trying to technical thing. Where I mean, will I mean, you but I, I believe so that I have that, a question from the audience uh, who posted. So if you have any questions, please post it on facebook.com slash hive data. So there is a question from Sajnath. He's asking, um, is there a size beyond which people should use Hadoop? And is there a size beyond, if it is less than that size, then maybe Hadoop doesn't make any sense. Depending do you guys do use do. that measurement? Well, you know what, even if my video is only, you know, let's say one gig, I can't process that in Oracle. Uh, right? no, I, I, think, need, I need I think the question is like, more about you know, the total amount of data. If you it's have not, it's nothing to do with this type of data that matters. Okay. So for certain things like I can do with MapReduce, I just really, so let's say I have a little, uh, bunch of documents that I want to invert to oh. create a search index. I cannot do that in Oracle no matter what. I do need MapReduce. So, yeah, so, so it, it's, it's not the, it's the type of data that matters and what you're trying to do with it. So one like I said, my, my other example was a couple terabytes, uh, but short cycle time, you throw a lot of nodes at that. And another example, I mean, HBase applications, like how, how many of those? They're mostly uh, small. Yeah, but the the, medium it, it might be a couple terabytes, but it oh, might yeah. be you need really, really high concurrency so, requirements, and that's actually what's, what's being So built. this is a good question, because I think when somebody in the enterprise is trying to use it, um, this question comes saying that, okay, is, going to, is, is, is it time for us to do some Hadoop stuff, or should we put all this data in Hadoop from day one, right? Um, the other thing is data grows, right? So that's the other thing is that you, you start yeah, off data, 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 okay, exactly. data is going How, to grow. What is the rate at which your data is growing? So that could be another factor into saying whether we should be using I mean, the other thing is that Hadoop actually systems. scales horizontally. So it's not like you have to start with a 50-node cluster or a 500-node cluster. Mm -hmm. So you could start with a 510-node cluster okay. and then grow both your processing and your storage. Yeah, sure. So while talking about adoption in the enterprise, maybe... Um, so I worked with Jonathan uh, and Facebook on some of the big data processing storage software, especially like real-time software. So I have some questions, but let us uh, watch another video that uh, from uh, Jonathan. Uh, He's got surprises today. <laughs> so, so this is a project that I think Jonathan is talking about that me and Jonathan work together, or parts of it together. Every system before that was an online system or an offline system. And for the first time, we have a system like Puma, which is the second thing I talked about in my talk today, that is kind of real-time streaming matters. And so we're actually using HBase as an analytics kind of data warehousing BI tool. But so the question is that you talked about lots of things in this one, right? You talked about real-time. You talked about streaming. You talked about Facebook Puma processes and stuff like that. So you have been focused a lot on Hadoop real-time stuff, right? So how important is like streaming analytics? Or do you distinguish between streaming analytics and just query serving? Um, and which do you think is somewhere that the community will move forward to in the next few months or years? Or how, will that, how does the enterprise consume this stuff? So I think you know, in the short term, there's really two different types of things that I'm seeing. One is exploratory ad hoc type of analytics. And the other is. Um, known questions, asking questions I already know that I want to ask, and then asking those on a continual basis. And I think right now those things are completely separated. And people are building application software, and people are building Hive queries and pig jobs and things like that. Uh, or they're using a SQL engine on top of Hadoop or whatever. And I think where it's going is somebody is using analytics tools to poke and prod and try to ask different types of questions. As soon as I know the question I want to, I want to answer, I then want to answer that question all the time, in real time. And I think you know, that's one of the things we saw with the Puma system, with a lot of different customers that we have at Continuity is, look, we've been doing this thing in batch. It's just inevitably a better product in real time. And so how do we move this thing that we've been doing over here into a real time system? Um, 
Today, I think it's actually not easy. It's two different implementations. And I think the future is hopefully... So, so is this something that an enterprise should keep in mind when doing their Hadoop installations? Or does it play a part in adopting? Because some of the systems that they might be using right now could be more real-time than what Hadoop is. Um, yeah, so how do they view this? Do they see that, oh, if I use Hadoop now, my systems become actually less real-time versus building something? Yeah, I mean, I think if they already have an answer to their problem and they're thinking about moving to Hadoop for their real-time problem, they better really understand what they're getting into, obviously. <laughs> okay. uh, you know, and so you know, you're kind of entering, I think, on that real-time world, world, you're getting a lot of noise in terms of people who want a NoSQL database or people who want something like that. And so you have to be careful. On the enterprise side, it's really, do people want to do BI and data warehousing and analytics stuff? Or do people have an end use case application that they're trying to solve? I so see. you know, I'm Citibank. Is it that I want to analyze all of my customer records? Or is it that I want to actually do deal targeting to my customers on my credit card website? And these two very different classes of applications sure. are like right. two different worlds that I right. see in big data. Right. And I think as time goes on, these things are going to come together. Because part of the power is it's one data platform. And so all the data can go on here. And so whether you have a business analyst who's running a 10-minute uh, MapReduce job on it, or I actually want to serve recommendations to my user, I can do that out of a single data platform. And now the problem is we can do that theoretically, but the tools are not there. And okay. the, the abstractions are not there for a developer to actually be able to build it. So uh, Charles, you have any question? Because like the thing that he mentioned is that if you already have a real-time system or a semi-real-time system in an enterprise, and then you are trying to say that, can I move to Hadoop? Uh, I think uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but from what I understood is that it, it, people should think a lot before they try to move Hadoop I in the real-time. So what is your so, opinion about adoption? I think it's so hard to answer. In the enterprise? I think the phrase, well, adoption enterprise is a separate question. But no, as far as real time aspect of it is concerned, bad systems, yes, I think people are adopting. So here's, here's what I, I mean. So, so I'd say that it's really hard. You have to actually define uh, real time. You know, it's just it's just that real time is kind of a, is kind of a marketing buzzword. Uh, there are lots of use cases I can, I know of today where customers uh, took a process that was running in uh, a database or some other kind of custom program. They migrate to Hadoop and it's faster. The cycle time is shorter. Uh, I can give you examples like um, content recommendations. People that uh, used to only think about like how they laid out content on a site uh, once every day, and now they're recycling these, you know, once every five minutes. Is that real time? I don't know. It's a lot faster than what they had before, right? Uh, and then if you say, well, no, 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 like I want real time, I want subsecond. Well, great. Well, now we can do that. We've got query engines. They're fast. You say, no, that's not good enough. It's got to be streaming. All the cool kids are doing streaming. Bully, right? You've got two or three different options. You can use uh, what was the one? Storm. You can use HStreaming. You can do lots of other things there. So there's many, many choices at your disposal. Um, but I really think uh, taking back, uh, taking a step back and saying, like, you know, what's the business problem I'm trying to solve? Like, what, you know, what's the advantage I'm trying to get by lowering latency? Uh, and then pick figuring out like what to what so to apply I, is, is, so the real, yeah, is the real is the real goal, right? Looking at your answer, I think it, here I picked something from the Cloudera uh, press release. It says real time is waiting less. Yeah. Uh, so is that right? So at the end, look at the end of this page. Yeah. Right? So it's not. Well, so this is the thing. So, so like, if, will if you, you be able to sell this to an enterprise? So saying, you, oh, I'll make you wait less. You, yeah, if you, if you, of course, if you run, I'll tell you. Like, no. Practically speaking, here's here's what. Uh, practically speaking, pay less, wait less. So, so <laughs> practically speaking, here's here's the real world uh, experience with users on Hadoop right now. Uh, there there are a lot of there are only so many MapReduce developers that work in a given company. Only so many job developers. There are more BI users by far. Right. For every one MapReduce developer, I can go find you ten MicroStrategy users. Today, if you try to query Hadoop data using MicroStrategy, even using a space age platform like MapR, what you will find is that <laughs> simple, uh, simple queries that people are used to have come back in half a second will take uh, you know, a minute, two minutes. And the reason why is because you're going through a batch system that materializes every step. And unfortunately, what exacerbates it is BI tools, because BI tools auto-generate really funky SQL that overcomplicates the SQL plan anyways, right? So your SQL was a little complicated to begin with. Hive didn't like that anyways. It all passed through. And so, so people just get really frustrated, right? It's a, it's, <coughs> and, and for an analyst, the, the, the basic issue is I want to be able to ask a question. I want to be able to get a result back and kind of keep that result like state in my head before so, I ask the next question. So it's about the experience you deliver for that user. And right now, that user is turned off from uh, what's possible in Hadoop. So, uh, I don't, for them, they would consider that real time. Sure, yeah. for, for someone who's doing uh, 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 high-speed uh, trading, 
at Wall Street, I'm sure they think sure. this is a slug's pace. Yeah, okay. So I have another question on the web from uh, one audience, um, person Premanshu. So he, kiss, he asks, how close is Hadoop to real-time analytics? So that's the question I think we're trying, all trying to answer. Um, you have uh, anything to contribute there so in that the, question? The two points. I think one, I mean, I, I don't disagree with my colleagues. I think one other thing is that a lot of the traditional system had data structured to answer a certain, uh, a certain class of questions. And, and so you could answer those questions well because the data was structured. It was a smaller amount of data. What Hadoop has actually done is to be able to ask questions that you hadn't thought of before, and therefore you didn't structure your data to fit the question you had pre-thought. Okay, mm -hmm. and and the amount of power in there is is incredible. So it may actually uh, uh, not work as fast as something that is optimized, where the data is actually structured exactly for the kind of questions you're going to ask. Okay, and so you're kind of comparing apples to to oranges there because this is solving a much broader cas uh, class of problems. And Hadoop is is improving, okay? Okay, uh, yeah, sure. And so I think that's a very important thing to not miss out. The amount of data you can uh, you can process, and the uh, or the open-ended questions you can ask that you weren't able to ask before. So, uh, to, okay. to, to, totally agree. That's far more the strength of it, uh, for Hadoop. Anyways, the last you, you want a number, twenty milliseconds. Right? We have we have customers. To, uh, uh, actually, not customers. It's a, a ISV. They're building an app on top of HBase, and this app has to insert itself into an online uh, process, and so. They're selling it to like e-commerce companies. Uh, so the e-commerce company, they're really sensitive to how much latency gets added to any step in their site, right? Because they worry about people abandoning. Uh, and so the SLA is 20 milliseconds. Ooh. You have to be able to, uh, uh, Hadoop or HBase in this case, has to be able to consistently give a 20, uh, 20 millisecond SLA. So to your, so, to your question asker, uh, is 20 milliseconds real time for you? Because that's, that's I think you know, when you're talking about like real time, then there's also the cost aspect to it, right? So if you don't load your systems well enough, then you get very good latencies. Uh, whereas if you put more and more load, then latencies suffer. So I mean, just not, you could get 20 milliseconds, but you, I don't know how much the is anything customer coming has to from pay. Desk, is everything from memory is what you're asking, right? Uh, yeah, yeah I mean, you could do all those right. trade-offs. It could be. So, I mean, but if it's important data and it's important to them, they're willing to yeah. pay the money for it to make yeah, it real absolutely. time. So that's kind of a mute question. Uh, I think uh, also in the Hadoop ecosystem, HBase is kind of used a lot for some of, or used a big chunk of uh, applic or applications which want to do real-time stuff, right? Um, so um, the interesting thing that I saw is that I was trying to look for to find an idea like how many people are using HBase for real-time analytics. And then um, I came around this uh, slide, which, which talks about the layered architecture of HBase is eliminated. So M7 is this product from MAPR, which is um, a better or different design than HBase. So um, Jonathan, let me ask you this question. What do you think is this layered architecture of HBase, which is eliminated, and why do you think yeah. that is really bad? Because you layer. have worked a lot on HBase, right? You know internals of HBase. Layers of abstraction are good. Yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, I think a lot of the stuff in the M7 paper is, is legitimate uh, concerns about HBase and the architecture. Um, I don't think any of them are insurmountable. Um, you know, I think that's part of the power of HBase is that it's transparently layered on top of HDFS. And so, you know, it says that M7 is, you know, the first file and table in a single data store. Um, HBase is just the read and write cache on top of HDFS as the data store. And so it's really just that buffering kind of layer on top, and it's still HDFS as the core data engine. And so I think that's one of the real strengths of HBase is its ability to very transparently just sit on top of HDFS. And so I can write out HDFS files, for example, which is a very common way that people write data into HBase. I can just write my HDFS files in sequential order and then load those up into HBase in a second. You wouldn't so, need that if HBase was natively fast. You didn't need. You don't need the side door, right? I mean, I mean, the the, so, the point here. Sorry. Yeah. So the question I have actually for you is that uh, there are different architecture, right? So is this something that a customer or an enterprise needs to understand when they try to use whether M7 or HBase? Uh, do the they actually ask you this question? Yeah. Do so, they ask you, so, say, oh, no, is your so, architecture better than what HBase is? So I'm going so to use it. Let, or me, let me put it to you differently. They just look at the end numbers. So, number one, open API. That is, the API is owned by the community. No one con company controls it. That is very important for them, whatever technology they use. So, HBase API, you know, we follow that strictly. Number two, our uh, majority of our customer support calls are HBase, majority of them. 
Why? Well, it may not be true for either Hortonworks or Cloudera because, I mean, with, with MapR's, the, the storage layer, we kind of we don't get that many calls anymore on, on, the, on the storage layer. But our majority of calls are HBase, and they said, please do something about it. We are running our business on this. Please fix it. And at that point, they don't really care if it's X or Y or Z or M7 or whatever else. They want HBase to work. Uh, and they are not like a Facebook or a Yahoo who can afford uh, you know, a team of 70 or 80 developers who sit down and, you know, uh, I mean, think about, like, let's say, Bank of America, right? And they're running HBase. I mean, my God, you think they're going to let any source code out of that company into, into the open source? You're not, never going to find committers who can actually fix things in, in the community from most enterprises. They're not allowed to even send emails out, for heaven's sake, right? Uh, so for them, they want a good HBase that just works without, I mean, their, their problem is this, right? They have an they're admin staff. They're not giving them a good HBase. Well, hold on. Uh, that's a theoretical. Uh, that's a theoretical argument, right? I mean, the the problem is that it's they have they, they have they have they have an IT. What you're Hold on, we can go down all the. Uh, the I think I think I think the point is that I think. Uh, HBase the API is what they're getting, and that's all they care about. API. Right, that's what they care about. HBase, we call it enterprise well, it HBase. I think that is the question so, I'm so going to and, ask. And, right? and they what they about? do care about, right? It says so they have an IT staff who's responsible for, let's say, your. Uh, uh, desktop security, your badges, your uh, NetApp backup, your Oracle backup, and by the way, this is this is other little thing called Hadoop. And why did you give it to me to manage? Right? Can can it just work? I, I, I mean, that's what I, they I want. I think we can carry that conversation to the end and say that maybe we should have everything as a service. But let me come to that later on, right? Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's that a, that's makes map our stuff. So having as a service so, is a different problem so because then there's data security issues that people won't let data out of their company. Yeah. So the cloud providers are facing that and they have their own. Uh, sure. Yeah. There are other sets of problems that, to right? be solved there. Right. But but, um, but my question, <coughs> a relevant so question. On-prem, mm -hmm. what they want is a very stable edge base, and so. That's our response. You know, uh, we looked at the M7 architecture. Uh, sorry, the HBase architecture, Apache HBase no, architecture. No, I know you there. looked at it, but my question is that: mm -hmm. Do customers look at it? They don't want to. That's my point. Yeah. They That's don't want point. to look at it. They want to just use it, and it has to just work. Right. So, a question for uh, Charles there. Uh, so, uh, we have the like HBase, uh, Hadoop, uh, Hive, Pig, and other things that customers use, um, and some of, some of them use some software, and the others use different set of software. Sure. Now, how do you see this play out with different um, size companies? Like, let's say I have a five-people startup versus I have a, um, a, 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 a maybe a 500-people start um, company which has been in existence for a while versus, say, a company like HP or IBM, which, is, which has been there for 50 years. Do you see that uh, Hadoop and Hive or HBase, Pig or anything else you need, need uh, how are they getting adopted in the enterprise for these different sections of uh, from customers? From my experience, it's, it's way less correlated than you, you might think. Uh, I, I know banks that are pig users. I never thought that would happen. I thought that would just be SQL for days. And some folks like to use pig. It's great. Uh, about half our customers uh, use HBase in some form or fashion. I don't think that it's distributed particularly based on a particular, well, it's super popular in telecom. Uh, so I'd say that's uh, so that's actually the one thing I would say is uh, on HBase um, in a large enterprise, uh, telecom's been a big gift for HBase because all these mobile apps, uh, you know, all the concurrency that comes from that, it's just it's just a um, a, a really uh, a great use for that for that part of the platform. But no, I, my observation it's not um, it doesn't it doesn't actually allocate very cleanly to uh, company size, uh, maybe a little bit industry. So you have anything to comment, Sunday? I, I think I agree with him. You, you're seeing actually a variety of big companies uh, 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 actually having a small platform and, and acting really like, a, like what a smaller company would be. I think the other thing you're seeing that has changed uh, more recently is that, that you know, with, with uh, Ambari and with the Cloudware Manager, Hadoop is much more easier to consume than, for example, what, what you guys use internally at Facebook or what they use no, at, at Yahoo. So I'm saying the consumability before of Hadoop was that you yes. needed to have specialist. That has now changed because you have, have tools from the two main, main vendors that actually make Hadoop easy to install and use. You know, basically you can install a, a cluster uh, I understand, in minutes. but my question So, so I'm saying is, is that the speciality of, of having a big team yes. has changed. That's changed, but my question though is about is Hadoop being used differently by different size companies? So, yeah, How are you seeing yeah, this adoption on different seeing, size right? companies? So what I'm seeing in a lot of startups, the IT budget is bigger than their salaries, right? So you have a small startup with like 20 people who are, who are a big data startup. They're doing some kind of analytics or something. They do analytics as a service, and they're running a 300-node cluster, for example. 
Uh, big enterprises are always very cautious. They are you know, very cautious and when they adopt something, there's a lot of uh, signatures to sign off saying, and you know, they're very careful about, will I get fired if I bring this thing in here, right? So that's, that, you know, so it's a, it's a longer sales process and we see adoption, but then we also see, for example, very big enterprises going all in on Hadoop, right? I mean, one of, the, one of our uh, flagship accounts is American Express, and they really went all in on MapR, totally. I mean, like, everything is going on that. Uh, and it's, it's a very, very, it's a very amazing thing for us to happen, something like that, right? For, for example, Comscore did that. They're, they process about 50 billion events a day, and, and that's an enormous number of events, and, and they went all in. So Rubicon did that all in with MapR as well. And these are medium-sized companies. So I see actually two categories. One is the Web 2.0 companies that are very sophisticated Hadoop users and have you know, you know, great DevOps and everything. They know how to run it. They're using Hadoop as a tool to run their service. Then you have the enterprise guys, and then you have some early adopters and some late adopters. They're trying to figure out, well, you know, I know Hadoop is cool. How should I use it? I don't really. Does it replace Teradata? Can I, can I query it? Query it? How is it different from SQL? So you have some of those guys. Then we have guys like Telco and all who are like, you know, they have a real problem. They really can't use MySQL or Oracle. We need HBase. Get our event processing in there. Uh, and so they do that. So I've seen, you know, it's a, it's a broad spectrum. A lot of, you know, in, in uh, even in like, you know, healthcare or, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very broad, there's, it's not a vertical place, a very horizontal. I mean, right. you, you would. I think one yeah. thing that I see, you know, <coughs> Continuity is a much earlier stage company than these guys. Mm -hmm. We have way fewer customers, but one of the things that we're that we're seeing is we're not supporting on-premise yet, and so Continuity is hoping to work with these guys to, to get on-premise, and so we're a cloud platform, mm -hmm. and so for us, it's the enterprise is a no-go for a bunch of different enterprises, right? So we're talking to them and engaging them and saying, look, we're going to get there and, and that kind of stuff. But our customers are really small and medium-sized guys. Um, because those are the guys who don't want an ops team. And they're already using Amazon, they're already using Rackspace, they're already using SaaS services, they're using all these different things. And you know, they got a DevOps guy, one guy. That's who's gonna run their cluster, he's also gonna write code. Um, and so you know, our cloud platform is really oriented towards that type of person. And a lot of the enterprise customers um, are building things very much like what Continuity is building, an internal platform, Nokia built one. Um, and so we'd like to get into there. But right now, there's definitely a big divide in terms of it's on premise or no go. Yeah, it's on the cloud true. or I mean, no go. If it's a smaller medium so business, then maybe services make sense. So there are some questions on the web. Uh, one of them is a question for uh, Srivas uh, and why he is wrong. So I would like him to maybe comment on it when he gets a chance. Uh, I'm not going to read it out for now. Uh, so let us move on to um, another section. <coughs> Thank you. So please look at facebook.com oh, slash hive data. You will see very interesting questions there. And please post more. Gee, and that's always right. Uh, so let us talk about the open source and commercial distributions of Hadoop, right? Uh, so Hadoop <coughs> is open source, Apache license, blah, blah, blah. Then there are some other projects which are uh, non-Hadoop, but uh, kind of in GitHub, and part of it is open source licenses are different. So there are all these pros and cons. Um, so one of the... Um, things that I keep hearing uh, against Hadoop is that it's open source, so it slows down innovation in the community. So the, it's a consensus driven model. So a lot of people have to agree that, yeah, this is a great design before it gets implemented. Uh, and Sanjay being in the Hadoop PMC, do you have any comments on it? If you look at Hadoop releases, you will see that uh, Hadoop releases were like really frequent. And then I have a slide, but unfortunately it's not here. It very clearly shows uh, how the releases have become further and further apart. Any comments about that? So about innovations, let me say you. So for example, uh, one would say, okay, if you make the premise that open source cannot be innovative, okay, uh, Hadoop itself proves the contrary. Uh, there wasn't any technology by commercial vendors that even came close to Hadoop, okay? So here is an open piece of uh, open source technology that actually created something that, that, that caused a huge disruption, okay? So in a sense, it proves that open source can be innovative. And, and, and it wasn't a copy of, of some other commercial product, like, for example, Linux was a, a copy of, of, of Unix, okay? Yeah, this it's isn't a copy of Google's. Yeah, but it's not of a commercial product, okay? So oh, what I'm okay, saying is it, is it is innovative, okay. it is coming yes, out, sir. okay? And if you look at the, the changes that are occurring, yeah, there are areas where there are debates, but uh, one of the things that kind of quote something that Bill Joyce said, and he said, you know, that uh, uh, innovation occurs elsewhere. 
And what he's saying is you do not have, if you think your company has the corner on intelligence and on genius, it's not true. There are smarter people outside. And what open source brings is somebody comes from outside, okay, and creates something else, right? You know, his company is doing something, coming out with a different business model of how to use uh, HBAs as a service, right? Uh, or somebody comes out and creates a different technology on top of that. Uh, and so I think the innovation occurs because it's open source on a common platform. So why is it then that religious became farther so and farther I, apart? I, I think, the, so there was actually a very particular and it's kind of a deeper discussion on that. And I think the addition of security to Hadoop was the one that actually kind of stopped because it became a big project. Okay. okay. And then, uh, and then the, the... So is the, it true to say that if you want to move big features into Hadoop, like say security is one big feature, I don't know whatever else is coming up. Lim is it going to be more... No, more let me give an example. So for example, we are putting snapshots in. Okay. okay. Right now snapshots are being backported in fact to Hadoop 1. Okay. So something that started uh, uh, development about six, eight months ago is going to be available in Hadoop months in a, in a couple of months. Not in just Hadoop 2, but also in Hadoop 1. So it's, that's pretty fast, okay? And, and between us and Cloudera and the other developers, we're having no arguments. Yeah, we I see that it, customers yeah. want this feature, to be frank, okay, yeah, and we're making to be, it available. To be frank, like, the, Hadoop is, the Hadoop project is actually, like, a, a pro, every project is a reflection of the community that, that it's comprised of. And the motivations of the people that come there, right? Because you have a certain set of motivations, and you then you do work in that project that reflects those motivations. At the time when the releases were slowing down, there were a few large companies that were dependent on this infrastructure, Yahoo most notably, Facebook to a lesser extent. And they were all of a sudden, they went from, this was a cool project, to I'm hugely dependent on it, and there were tons of apprehension of change, right? At the time, we, Cloudera, were a much smaller company. And we were like, we'd actually like some change because we're a vendor and we need features and we got to get this thing going. And so, you know, but now actually we're more aligned than we've been in a while because most, a lot of the Yahoo people are working for a vendor, right? So, you know, like, like Sanjay just said, it's like he added, you know, the, the Horn workers started snapshots, we added HA, the system's much faster. All these things have happened pretty quickly. So um, let me so ask this question to Srivas then. So Mapper uh, is not like an open source uh, product. Right? For example, map our storage. Um, so how, why do you think that is a differentiator? How do you think you compete with these other arguments that our other panelists have uh, right. so, explained? So the truth of the matter is neither is Cloudera, right? So Cloudera is also closed source. A lot, a lot of it is closed source. Uh, and, and, uh, and I don't know, I mean, Hortonworks is also to some extent, they have some closed source stuff, even though they claim it's 100% open source. Give so everybody is here piece to, of software. Okay, listen. Isn't. Okay, you're ODBC drivers, right? They're all closed source, right? Do you, I, can I get the source code for that? Yeah. It's no, there. I don't think it's there. I think it's, it's, it's a proprietary. Which, which product are you talking about? <laughs> They're ODBC yeah, drivers for hype. Yeah, you can't. Right. Oh, so, so, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Okay, so, does anybody know how to can, can I just, it's not a false <laughs> thing. It's a, it's a true, it's part of their product. It's, it's closed source. It's part of their product. It's closed source. We have some portions in our, in our, some, though all the 90% of our stuff is open source, some of it is closed source. So, so it's, it's, so every company does this. That's how they make money. So right, let's be practical, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so hold on. Now, so let me come, on, come back and answer your question, okay. which is, uh, I forgot the question now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Charles, you want to I'll, yeah, <coughs> this come, As you can imagine, this comes up a lot. Um, I, I want to have the time to, to make a, a, Please, a, a, yeah. few, a few points here. Sure. Um, if, if the argument is, uh, only oh, on. the well, no, 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 one I second. Need, but let, I need to answer it, your question. No, I think <laughs> let, let, let it, right. yeah. <laughs> uh, if if the argument is the only one who can truly be open sourced is whose hands have never touched a piece of code that's ever been closed source, well, that is a goal of purity that no one shall attain. But then to say, oh, well, therefore we're all the same, that is a leap too far. Is it? Uh, yes. Now let's talk about it in customer terms, right? We don't have to talk about it in abstract terms. Um, so, uh, in customer terms, like they, the open source means, what, in my experience, basic uh, two two things to a customer. Actually, three things. One of the things it means is they're buying into an open standard. They're buying into a piece of IP oh, oh, oh. that multiple other vendors uh, uh, back. And so, if one vendor treats them poorly, they have some chance to move. Right? There's some notion of portability, and also that if one vendor went out of business, that someone's going to be able to pick this work and carry it on. Um, the second part of open source is when someone says they're an open source vendor. They're saying, hey, I have some capacity to support you. I have some capacity to drive a roadmap. I have some capacity to, to serve your needs, right? So to say that these companies here are making comparable investments or are offering you a comparable choice in portability or have comparable capacity to support open source 
is is just is just a very very cynical claim, right? All right. So, uh, now, so no, 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 no. If you look at if you look at if you look at the if you look at the aggregate investment in open source development by people who work at Cloudera or people who work at Hortonworks in comparison to Mapbar, there is no comparison. Then why is there's the product no, inferior? There's no comparison whatsoever. Right. Um, so, so for you to say, oh yeah, yeah, we're all open source, like it's all the same. No, 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 I'm saying you're all closed source. I'm not saying you're open. I mean, I agree they're you're open. partly open source. Okay, so let me, let me come back to what, so there are two different things. There's Hadoop, the product, and Hadoop, the API. And let's distinguish the two things because people really care about open APIs that belong to the community. So Linux, you know, if it was an open source uh, system that did not do POSIX, would not have made it, would not have been successful, right? The reason they got successful was they chose POSIX as their API. And that's what allowed them to be successful. It's not that because they were open source they got successful. It's, no. there, there are gazillions of open source projects that are not successful because they're all proprietary APIs. No, I mean, or, or some, hold on, let me finish. I'll let you talk, right? Yeah. So, the, so there's open source the API, and there's open source the technology that drives that API. So we firmly believe that everything in MapR is open APIs. So we have customers who have moved millions of lines of code from there or there into MapR within within a couple of days, right? I mean, these are like customers all over the all over the uh, you know in, in every vertical. So the API applies. Now, as far as saying that uh, you know is that good or bad? I don't know. I mean, today you know today we are better. Tomorrow you might get better. I don't know. But right now, okay, this thing works. Uh, I, okay, right? I see. I see your point. I mean, it, <coughs> you kind of distinguish between the API and the product. So this kind of, uh, this question was mostly in the sense that MapR is doing something different from one side and on the other side was Cloud and Hot and Works. I mean, we are addressing customer needs. We have, pro sure. we have customers who are saying, this doesn't work for me right now. When the name node goes into garbage collection, I have a HDFS outage for an hour. What do I do? Okay. I got to fix it. I have the same problem. Why we did M7? I mean, if, this is, this if, if is hold on, no, hold on. If, I think, if, I think the question finish, is not, if, not whether you have a customer if, segment or not. I'm sure you are selling well to customers. All I'm so saying is like, with it. so whenever there's right? been an open source project that works, yeah. we've just adopted it. I mean, there's so many, like Zookeeper just works. Absolutely, we don't touch it. Uh, high works, we use it. Okay. Pig works, we use it, right? So, we, okay. H catalog seems to work, we use it, right? So, but there are certain core things that we think, most of MapReduce, more or less works, so we use it, and we have modified the things that we think uh, need okay. to be improved. Let's by the way, that's back in open source. Yeah, too. let's talk about something so, uh, slightly yeah. different. Just one, yeah, uh, the, difference, the difference in open source is that our customers have enterprise requirements too. They want something to be more secure. Uh, they want something like HA. The difference is an open source vendor then develops open source software to solve that problem, right? That's the difference, right? You could, if you found all these reasons to critique HDFS, or I guess now HBase is your, your new hobby horse, you could have made... It, it you doesn't matter. Have, like like I said earlier, they don't even care about you whether what's up, running you underneath. Could have, you could have bucked up and you could have contributed that work to Apache HBase or to Apache HDP. You chose not to. And yes, that's the, the same reason you didn't contribute Cloud Runner Manager to open source. I mean, no, that's the same not, reason. There's, there's no other... Okay, 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 let's talk about something slightly IP, different. Right? IP, so this is... What about, we talked about closed source versus open source. It's, it's, it's nothing... Let's about talk also about the way... I just want to make a final point, right? When we started this earlier, this conversation, we said, do people really care whether it's the HBase API or what's underneath? And we said, look, it's X or Y or Z. They don't really care. Yeah, they do. They really care they about care. They do. They, but they do. They so I think they that's, what, that's what my customers but are telling me. I mean, the difference um, is API is one thing, and features and functionality is a different thing. And so if I <coughs> port to map R, and then I take advantage of this proprietary feature and that proprietary feature. Why, NFS is proprietary? I mean, NFS, I is, NFS is more open it's, than... No, 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 not NFS. Uh, NFS is more open than, thing. for example... Pick, pick something, one. pick something. The way you snapshot or yeah. the behavior... You, you don't care about what There's happens no underneath. There's no, There's no, no, no. portability what is that? only works on MapBar. No, the yeah. API is it's, the same. No, 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 no. no. Time out. This is, this yeah. is yeah. not yeah. yeah. how, how is snapshots changing any no, no, API? Is, okay. Jonathan is right. The difference I mean, you don't even... Customers don't care. No, the point is not the API. The point is portability. So let me give you a very specific example. Yeah, give me an example. So right now in M7, if I developed an application in HBase using coprocessors, how well does that port to M7? Do you have the same behavior for coprocessors? Coprocessors are being deprecated in HBase because of security concerns so and it's no. code injection. So no, 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 so no, no, no. no. It's, 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 it's not even a feature in HBase. It's only a, like a proposal that nobody's really using. That's, okay. Okay. I mean, the the problem, problem, that's so completely so incorrect. So you're saying security, security, security in HBase is implemented using co-processing. No, 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 it's being deprecated. What I understand. You have not adopted the HBase product. You have not adopted the HBase HDFS security model at all. 
Okay. No, no, no. HP you security haven't. model is Kerberos, so it's not. Okay. Your, it's not. Hers. No. Internally, it passes tokens, etc. You don't yeah. do any well, of this. Let's talk stuff. about something, right? Let's, let's talk about anything. That's internal. slightly different no, angle. You don't get it. So you guys <laughs> have different uh, licensing and different APIs. That's yeah, good. yeah, yeah. Now the question is, does it all become moot if uh, somebody takes these and makes it a service? So is Jonathan like out to kill all of your products because he's the guy who does the service? No, it doesn't. We're, we're distribution agnostic and we run on CDH, HTTP, and Mapper. So tell me, so tell me. What There's an example why open <laughs> APIs work, right? So why would you, how would you pick what you, maybe you, if you want, you can tell what you're using, but the question is how do you we pick what Apache. distribution to use? We use Apache, straight out of Apache. Uh, is that because you need to pay money to Mapper otherwise, or is it because it's, we, it's because we haven't signed our partnership deals with any of these guys? Yeah. No, the, the no, we're we're Switzerland. I mean, you know, it's yeah, it, it's it's our our business is definitely when we're building our hosted clouds to figure out what the best way to deliver performant, reliable systems are. And today we're using Apache. Um, you know, we haven't really used Mapper as a production thing at all. Um, or any of these things, those are things that we're going to explore. And See, the APIs are different sometimes, right? When you move between, say, releases of Hadoop or even if you want to move to MapR. So yes. It might not be as easy for an enterprise to move between different versions of Hadoop that easily. The API um, compatibility not really. is, is I think, one I think, element. I think uh, okay. all of HBase, is all of, they're like seven different heads in HBase, like 90, 92, 94, okay. 96. All of them work as is on MapR, no problems. I see. That's not the issue. The really issue is that I think... Uh, why, why cloud, there's a problem with the cloud, is that unless the cloud vendors declare what their security model is, people, to an enterprise. Let's say I go to a, a so Citibank or a Bank of America. About security model on the cloud Yeah, service, you, because right? your so question is about cloud, right? And if it's as a service, right. what's the barrier, right? The yeah. barrier is that why should a bank or somebody, you know, why should I trust that your security is good enough unless you tell me what you're doing and I can audit it, right? Uh, and so until that, and the cloud guys don't want to tell it because that's their secret sauce. So... There's a little bit of, uh, has to be a little bit of a cooperation between the cloud people and the, and the enterprises to understand that, okay, if I put my data here, these are the safeguards and I've audited this and, you know, this is working for me. So the barrier to entry to cloud is not that, you know, Hadoop administration is difficult. That's, I don't think that's even the problem. The problem really is that they just don't feel comfortable exposing that if there's a leak somewhere or something happens, then they are liable. So the liability yeah, has no, to be so addressed. So security is one point. So there are other cloud vendors, I think I see some question there, talking about like security in the cloud uh -huh. service. So that's a question that I think probably not answered or discussed in great detail earlier. Uh, so that's a valid point, I agree. Um, Jonathan, you have any comment like how you might be able to handle that? What is it? So I missed it. So, so if, if an enterprise wants to put its data into the cloud, yeah. they, what is the assurance they get that this cloud will treat their data with complete, uh, you know, uh, fire wallet from everybody. It's completely safe, secure, nobody else can see it. And the larger the enterprise you go into, they want to come in, for example, I want to put my data into Amazon, and let's say I'm the you know, biggest bank in the world. Yeah. I'll come back and say, show me, let me audit your processes. And before, you know, I have ISO 9000 certifications and so on, I have to make sure, at that point, I'm ready to use the cloud. So. It's, so I don't, I'm not sure uh, we out here can do that, anything about it, right? I mean, my question I don't though think it's is, that is: is this something that services company like Jonathan might have to think to see how uh, their service can be adopted by the enterprise community? I mean, definitely. I mean, it's we're we're not investing in that, right? I mean, we're definitely a we're, we're waiting to see how it all pans out in terms of cloud and enterprise. I mean, I think there's a ton of companies that are targeting that very very specifically. My company's approach is we're building a developer PaaS. If you're on-premise or you're in the cloud, your developers have a PaaS, right? Now, whether so you have other people managing that PaaS on-premise is a separate story. I see. And that, that's our perspective on it. Mm -hmm. You know, enterprise Sorry, and mean, security and, and stuff in the cloud. We have integrated with the two largest cloud providers on the planet today, right? I mean, Amazon and Google. Sure. Uh, so certainly they, they understand this problem extremely well. And I think, I think uh, a lot of enterprises understand that too. So Charles, you have some One small, comment? you know, uh, there are a certain lot of enterprises that have compliance reasons why they can't move data to the cloud and all that. But there are others that don't. And I think the other thing I would say, though, that's unique about Hadoop or big data, which makes cloud for large enterprises a little more challenging, is that data has a kind of gravity that compute doesn't have. So when you think about cloud, a lot of people think, oh, I can burst to the cloud and magically instantiate, you know, like a thousand instances. You can totally do that very easily with, with compute. You can even instantiate uh, a thousand node Hadoop cluster very quickly in the cloud, but then you gotta fill it. 
Cool. Right? And, and so the challenge is, so where is the data to fill it? If the data is in your data center, you get a problem pushing that through the straw, the internet right. straw, to fill it. So by contrast, if your data originates in the cloud, then it's, it's much easier to fill. So I think the logistical challenge is actually holding back more than the compliance I see. So right I guess if more and more things move to the cloud by themselves, the application is going to get better cloud, the data will pool there, and more, and more Hadoop will go there. Cool, yeah. So um, I think um, maybe we, we kind of talked about many different angles, right? We talked about uh, or models, open source models, closed source models. We talked about architecture. We talked about limitations of the product. Uh, but do any of you would like to say anything about saying that why, um, like for adoption in the enterprise, sometimes the enterprise is thinking that is this company going to be around for a long time or not? So do you have anything to say, maybe just maybe 10 seconds, why you think your company is going to last, outlast your competition, all the other four guys sitting next to you? In 10 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> so, so continuity sits above these guys, and so even if one of them wins, we can still win. Fair enough, yeah. No, 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 the problem. Fair enough. You have any comments, anybody else? I'm I mean, we are the guys <laughs> who actually wrote a large part of Hadoop, and we're partners, and we're going to be around. Uh, so I, I don't think... Uh, Viewprom and the fact that it's fully open source, customers are not worried because they can actually move between us. So the data farm is open. Problem. That's what your logic is that we support open move, data farm not worried about, for a long time. Uh, about the company. And I think uh, you want to say something about that. Shrivas? No, I mean there are a lot of techniques to worry. I mean the main thing you're asking is how good are your sales, right? Because if the sales are doing very well, then the company will survive. And the adoption, your your product is seeing traction in the market, then the company will survive. It's very normal. Okay. So you're talking right? about ex execution so, so You're not really talking about a vision there. You are mostly talking about. If no, no, I can no, the vision is better. good execution and a product that meets the market. If you don't have that, then you know, of course, sure. you're going to die. Of course. So, yeah. so the vision is very important. Yeah. Uh, and it and it drives everything. Whether how well you get funded, how will your customers are, adopt your stuff, and why they adopt it, because it's a long term. And when you when it's big data, it's a long term investment on your customer side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And they invest this on uh, on this for like the next ten years or so. And you also so, so they really want happily this. on the say the and, and open API rather than the open data format. Exactly. So you can so move out when you find something better than MapR. Please, you know, move your apps. It'll work. Right. Okay. Until then, you know. Okay. Yeah, on the cloud areas, I mean, I guess I'd, I'd say two things, right? One would be obvious, uh, which I think Shrivas mentioned, is market traction. You should look at judges by our customers, ju judges by our partners, judges by our ecosystem, because those are all signs of a company uh, that's going to thrive. Obviously, you should have, you know, be well capitalized as well. And the other part of it is desire, right? A lot. I mean, and, you know, there's no way you can prove this. This is another example of cheap talk, right? Which is I can't, I can't, I can't uh, prove to you uh, uh, that this is the case, but I can tell you that Cloudera is committed to being an independent company. We think this is a massive opportunity. And I, what, I, what I feel when I meet customers is they hunger for an independent. They hunger for someone to help them rethink the natural order of things because it's been the same way for a very, very long time. And uh, you know, at Cloudera, we're committed to being that company. Cool, yeah, so thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. I think we talked about a lot of things, like I said, but the takeaway from my side, at least, is that uh, looks like the Hadoop community is kind of fragmented, but there are a lot of solutions, so people should be able to pick and choose whatever solutions they want based on their needs, streaming, real-time, flash, disk, all that stuff. Um, and um, hopefully we'll have uh, more and more companies doing this stuff uh, and also more applications which use Hadoop and, use app and applications which use Hadoop in a different way. I think that a lot of innovation will happen there. So the Hive, um, the, the Hive company is kind of focused on driving some of those innovations of applications which sit on top of Hadoop. Uh, so thank you. Thanks a lot, panel uh, guests. And thanks a lot for having uh, And if you have more questions, if you have questions, please post on the Facebook slash Hive data, and we will try to answer some of those questions for you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Well, what a great job. And uh, I wish we could continue for another hour or so and, and get into some of a little bit more blows. <laughs> so so uh, we have a book. Maybe Please we can, and wish we can me show you. Many of you um, have probably seen this book. And, yeah. and so we will have this author come and speak at one of the Hive events. And, and so Pashu is uh, 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 as a kind of a token of gratitude from the Hive. Pashu is going to have the <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for having us. As, as Pashu mentioned, we have a number of exciting events. Yesterday, a lot of you heard about Facebook's new uh, graph search. So we have a talk coming up 
uh, in, in probably a few weeks. Mm -hmm. We have a, we have an event with uh, Ted Dunning of uh, MapR on real time learning. I think two weeks from now. Yeah. So uh, please join us. Join our uh, uh, our meetup. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. And for all the entrepreneurs out there, please reach out to us, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you all. Thanks, Thanks John.